It is uh, March 20th, 2019, here in Jerusalem at the home of Elihu Katz, who we're interviewing. Um, we'll start first with a little bit of your autobiographical background. You were born May 31st, 1926, in New York City. Give me a little bit about your, your uh, upbringing in New York City. That's a good place to start. Um, my parents came at a very early age from Europe where? To, to New York. From where in Europe? My father from Poland, my mother from Austria somehow. And they came at an early age and they went through the, each of the areas of settlement of the Jews in New York City until they got to Flatbush and to within Flatbush to the area called Midwood or East Midwood, which entitled itself the Garden Spot of Brooklyn. Um, and what was interesting about that area, as far as I understand it, from Marshall Sclair's book, Conservative Judaism, it was the first area in New York where there was, where the Jews were a minority, so to speak. The first community in which they moved, to which they moved in smaller groups than the dense settlements that preceded it. Like the Lower that East Side. Was Lower East Side and Williamsburg and Crown Heights and Flatbush, and within Flatbush, East Midwood, the garden spot of Brooklyn or something. Um, in that area, what happened, according to Marshall Sclair, was that the rabbis began to speak in English. Decorum became a main issue of the synagogue. And my parents, together with some other people in the community, established the first, probably the first Hebrew day school in the United States called the Yeshiva of Flatbush. Very the fam the famous, famous, of course. Very famous. So many famous graduates, yes. Right. In the, at first, the yeshiva of Flatbush started with lower grades and then gradually increased both its population of children and absorbed immigrant intellectuals who were now becoming part of the community as teachers. Some of those people ultimately became professors, which they deserved. In higher in, in institutions of higher learning, so in that environment, there was a great interest in Hebrew, the language, in Judaism, the religion, and it was sort of modern Orthodox, like wearing ties, and um, then they. At the same time, they were, of course, increasingly interested in Zionism. My mother was uh, our mother. We, we were two children. My brother Carl, who died last year, and me. And our mother was uh, active in the Mizrahi Women of America. And the father was very active in general in Jewish affairs, but especially the two institutions that sort of molded us were the young Israel of Flatbush, which was a thriving and creative place, and the yeshiva, which were next door to each other. So that's the sort of background in which we grew up. There was no high school at the time, which there is now. 
So it was only in elementary school. The parents worried whether after eight years of two languages we wouldn't be confused by Midwood High School, and we were not confused. Mm -hmm. We did fine. And um, I went on to begin at Columbia College, and my brother also at Columbia University as a student of Meyer Shapiro, the art historian, very, very famous. And so let, then I was drafted in the army, but let me say a word about my brother before we go back to that. Carl was a brilliant, um, as his book is entitled, Exhibitionist. But that's, he grew into that. Uh, exhibitionist in the, as a pun, of course, uh, meaning he was a, a creator and designer and director of museums. But as a child, as a boy, as a student at Columbia, he studied Yemenite illuminated manuscripts. Because he was one of the few people at Columbia, an art at the time, who knew Hebrew from the yeshiva of Flatbush. And in that process, he got connected with the first exhibit of the State of Israel in a museum. It was at the Metropolitan Museum, and it was called From what was it called? Anyway, from the land of the Bible, that's what it was called. And it was an archaeological exhibition marking the establishment of the State of Israel and its entry into the big world of art and archaeology. It is in 1948. Yes. So Carl was probably 49, 49 or something like that. So Carl was this student at Columbia University working on Hebrew manuscripts from Yemen, and they looked for some kind of assistant with this exhibition who knew Hebrew and English. So they discovered Carl Katz, and that's the beginning of his illustrious career. So he went on to become the assistant in this exhibition, as a result of which he won a fellowship in archaeology of the Middle East, of the American Schools of Oriental Research, excuse me, from which he commuted to Jerusalem uh, as part of this fellowship, and suddenly the director of the Tzalel Museum, Narkis, died. So that who would be a more natural choice to succeed him than this young man who was lucking it through his career, and so he became a director of the Israel Museum. And then the Israel is uh, the director of the Betzalel so, Museum, and then Betzalel merged with the Museum of Archaeology and the Dead Sea Scrolls and the Billy Rose uh, Garden and all of these elements to become the Israel Museum. So he's one of the founders of the Israel Museum, and you can read all about it in the exhibition. Anyway, after that, he moved to the Jewish Museum in New York and then to the Metropolitan Museum. So he came full circle, and he died as a retired chief curator at the Metropolitan Museum in charge of loan exhibitions, exactly where he started. And um, it's worth remarking 
his mm. career because it's so in so unique and so glorious in that sense and so much more Zionist, not self declared. So when he came to, to Israel then it was before you ever came to Israel. Yes, correct. What was that influence on you? He'd come back and say, oh, you got to see what's going on there. Well, we, we actually were there from, we were here from 56 to 58. Well, I'll go back. Not right. to me. Okay. What year did you graduate in Midwood in Columbia? Midwood would have been 50, I guess. No, it can't be. If you were born in 26, 26 then you would have been plus to, to high school. It would have been you would have yeah, been plus 40. 13 is 39, right? Yes. That's say 40. Uh, so then entering high school would be correct. So you would, would have been class of 44 or 45. Yeah, maybe. Okay. Okay, and then Columbia. And Columbia was, it started in 44, and then it was the United States Army certificate in the Japanese language as an interpreter in the United States Army. So you didn't serve overseas? Yeah, it was in you Japan. You were in Japan? But the war was over. I mean, it was never an invasion right. of Japan. It was an occupation, but not an invasion. So in 45, 46, I returned to Columbia, finished, and then got a bachelor's degree in 48. And a master's in 50, and a doctorate in 56. Uh, but that's only degrees. What's interesting is that, I mean, for you, is that during the time of high school, uh, late high school, we were a group of about 10 young people in Flatbush at the Young Israel and the Yeshiva back and forth, which established, a young, which began to cook a, a more a formal interest in Zionism, meaning we began to organize lecture series and stuff like that. And uh, at the Young Israel, we somehow learn the game of organization. And uh, I remember some of our guests included university, Hebrew University professors, like Ernst Simon, for example, just as an example. But anyway, we went on this way, and during my, the period of returning to college, I became active in an organization called the Intercollegiate Zionist Federation of America, which had a couple of thousand students at the beginning, in the late 40s, and uh, Shlichim, like Ruth Katz, and um, so, and the shlichim, the shaliach before Ruth, from Noar of Hechalutz here, was Yuval Elitzur, whose name you will know as a journalist, and he married Judy Elitzur, who was the daughter of Rabbi Newlander of Queens. So there was this this habit of marrying a shaliach, uh, which became prominent. Uh, I wanted to ask you about, before we go, we go on, come yeah. back a second. In high school, mid-40s, do you recall what, what was being said about the possibility 
of the creation of a state of Israel and how... I don't. No. Okay. But I'm sure there was talk of that. I'm, I'm positive. The earliest I can date myself organizationally is 48. I wrote a pamphlet for the Zionist Organization of America, or I edited a pamphlet for the giant Zionist Organization of America. I don't know how they discovered me. I think it was through a neighbor who was an, a, a, a staff member of the ZOA named Seymour Liebman, who decided that I should produce a pamphlet in 1948 for the propaganda purposes of the Zionist Organization of America, although it's a straightforward document. I mean, it's just sources, so to speak. It's no writing on my part, I don't think, but I'll show it to you if you want. I have a copy. Anyway... And where were you on May 14th, 1948? I don't know. Huh. I should know, but I don't know. Because, I mean, because I'm my most well, my second West best well known book is called Media Events, partly definable by remembering where you were when something was live on television and stopped the world like Sadat's coming to Jerusalem. But May 14th, 15th, 1948, I don't know where I was. It had to be in, I don't know, it had to be... At Columbia. At Columbia, we at home. But anyway, so uh, then I was active in ISFA, this Intercollegiate Zionist Federation. And um, gradually I became president, partly pushed by the Shlicha of the President source. of the national group. Yeah. And so things happened. Ben Gurion came to visit. You have a picture of that. Uh, but the most, the, the best anecdote of that period is how uh, we had to, about how we had to schnorr money from each of the Zionist groups that supported us. So the anecdote is you needed two pieces of equipment to schnorr. One was a kippah and the other was a tie. So for a kippah and a tie, that would be Mizrahi. For a kippah without a tie, that's a poil on Mizrahi. For a tie without a kippah, that's the, Zion, the ZOA, the Zionist story. For nothing, no kippah, no tie, is poil So. Those are the two pieces of equipment that you needed to have good relations with those four uh, fundraising or fund giving bodies. Were you a good fundraiser? I don't know. <laughs> I guess. Good enough. So there was this organization which lasted some years after Wood, but in 48. It was, or I would say 49, 49 probably was at, the, at its height with several thousand members, some really people who would become distinguished because this was on college campuses. And you would go around the country? I know that the Shlicha would go around the country. Um, maybe I did. We had, a na na we had national conventions. Yes where people came together. So that was at different places. We didn't get as far as California as far as, I mean, I didn't get as far as California, but places like Detroit and so on. And uh, 
it was a lot of fun, and we sang Hebrew songs, which uh, that's how I became president, singing Hebrew songs. Uh, I know Bano Arca and so on. And uh, that's it. That's the end of my story, I think. I then became the next. I'm thinking of Zionism, not me. Well, we'll, we'll do both. Go ahead. Stay with Zionism. Well, the, the, the next Zionist thing I did was to leave my, take a leave of my job at the Hebrew University as an associate professor to establish, to head the task force that was charged with establishing television in Israel. That's the end of my Zionism. But tell me, tell me the talich, the, that story, how that went, how, how you created television in Israel. Well, what happened... This was, is the 1960s, we're in the 60s, right? Yeah. Well, after the Six-Day War, 60, exactly 67. So the story of that is very curious. The minister in charge of information, so-called information, was Israel Galili. And he was having a fight with the director of radio, Givtone, the exact nature of which I'm, I've never been able to find out, but there are people who probably know. But it was partly about political party, and partly that they didn't trust each other. Galili was more achduta avuda. We don't know about Kivto. He was head of the radio. But that was called Rashut Hashidur, as that's what there was. The only hint of television that there was in the country at the time was the Rothschild donation of a tele an instructional television system which was broadcast from uh, television, uh, whatever it's called now, but it then was called uh, Televisia Limudit, uh, uh, at the campus of the University of Tel Aviv. And it went around the country to schools. But it was a very minor affair, which Givton, during the 67 war, tried to uh, use, let's say, because the Arab states were broadcasting using the, the uh, frequency that had been assigned by the, whatever it's called, uh, to broadcasting in Israel. But without broad, in the absence of broadcasting in Israel, the Arabs were sort of reaching over the border, especially to Israeli Arabs, and including Mizrahim, who knew Arabic, and some of these people had Ara had television sets because of that. They could get broadcasting and watch an Arab movie. So the war was over. There was the glorious uh, celebration of the end of the war, and the idea which Ben Gurion had completely objected to of establishing television for several reasons, but mostly to soft soft talk the Arabs in the occupied territories, because nobody had any well not nobody, but because there was no easy way to talk to them. And it was thought that television would be a softer cell, more human, 
than radio, which was a fighting medium at the time, run by, especially by Sassone and other people in Misrata Chutz. It sort of responded to broadcast from the Arab countries, and that's how radio in Arabic sounded up to 67. So Galili then was charred, it was sold the idea, or somebody got the crazy idea that television would be the answer to this problem. What do you do? How do you talk nicely uh, to the occupied territories? How do you anticipate problems, etc.? So the government decided to establish television broadcasting, but mostly in Arabic. So the original television, the, what we were charged with as a task force was to give a, a high priority to yeah. broadcasting in Arabic and more hours than Hebrew. Huh. Which quickly changed during the year of a uh, year and a half in which we actually set up the system. But the, the politics of it is that Galili then asked, instead of give tone, and be partly for a technicality that television was not included in the law of the broadcasting authority, which is a stupid excuse, asked El Ad Peled, General El Ad Peled, to do this, to head the task force, and he agreed. And I'm sorry, and then, I'm sorry, I got my dates slightly wrong. Before the war, this began to happen. Yet Galili had an agreement with Elad Pellet to uh, do this job. Then the, in the war, Elad volunteered to be to head the northern sector of the IDF. And so he did. And when he came back from the war, he said no more television. He didn't want to do it. So Galili was desperate, and he knew me from a series of studies, surveys, that we did prior to the war uh, as the a cooperative effort between me at the university in communications and Louis Gutman's Israel Institute of Applied Social Research. Now, that's an interesting part of my story, which you can remind me to tell. Because, well, I can tell it now, just as a parenthesis, that at Columbia, when I studied sociology, there was a thing called the Bureau of Applied Social Research. And um, I was part of that. I mean, I was the youngest member or something. And they had a lot of PhD students who were interested in quantitative work. And then when I came to Israel, I realized that Louis Gutman, Professor Louis Gutman, who had founded the Israel Institute of Applied Social Research, had really done a copy of the Columbia Bureau. And so I felt very much at home there and worked with them from the beginning. And ultimately, uh, it's my other Zionist contribution, ultimately for a couple of years became director of the Israel Institute when Louis Gutman died, close parenthesis, okay? So, Elad retired, and not retired, withdrew, 
and Galili was desperate, and he knew me from those surveys that we did for his Office of Information, especially about preparedness of the civilian population on the eve of the Six-Day War. We worked, and so Galili knew my name. He might have known that I had a a, a, a door sign or whatever that's called saying Professor Eliu Katz uh, what is it I don't know communicate Department of Communication yes, I found that a Department of Communication here which is now thriving at the Hebrew University it's another Zionist uh, mark uh, check so, Galili thought communications, television. So I'll ask Katz. So here he was sitting here, there. He came to the living room, got a glass of tea, and said, would you do this? And I said, but I don't know anything about, I, I studied television and its effects, but I don't know anything about connecting the fuses or things like that. So he didn't care. He said, do it. So I said, okay. I mean, after thinking about it, it was an adventure to which you couldn't say no, even though it was wrong probably to say yes. Wrong because you really, and so there was, there's a whole story about that there was a contract between the Broadcasting Authority and CBS to advise. But all they wanted to do was to sell I Love Lucy to uh, Israel, and they were useless. But I had friends at the BBC, colleagues and, not friends, but people I knew who were willing to help. And these people were Stuart Hood, who was director of a channel something of the BBC, the channel, I guess, two. <clears throat> and um, his then wife, uh, who was the niece of Gershom Scholem. Renee Goddard was her name. She was an actress. And um, Jeremy Isaacs, who founded uh, uh, Channel 4 in England, it was an independent producer, then became head of Channel 4, and then became head of Covent Garden. So those people, were much more the people that we needed than the CBS people who were completely commercial oriented. These are all parentheses. I don't know if you want to yeah, know. Yes, 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 yes. Anyway, those were and Jeremy Isaac's brother was blown up on Kikarzion in this refrigerator bomb. I remember. So those were, so I said, okay. And together with Uzi Pellet, whose history I don't know, but he was the Mancal of the Institute of Applied, Gutman's Institute of Applied Social Research. So I recruited him because he was a great administrator. And together we went around and collected some people both from the radio and abroad who had some knowledge of television or who were willing to compete for jobs in this new system. So it was something like the Ta'agid recruitment. Who do you pick from the old timers to do the same thing that they were doing under another title with slightly different equipment? And so we recruited people, 
uh, who could teach and were willing, and others who were willing to learn. And uh, we got a lot of equipment. You, a lot, some of it used, like the outside broadcasting van, which was used for the first ever broadcast of national television in Israel, the Independence Parade of 1968. Where were you? <laughs> uh, but anyway, I want to say a word about the Independence Parade of 1968. This was interesting because it was the exact opposite of what we proclaimed when we thought of sweet-talking the Arabs. Because right. it was aggressive, it was a march through the old city on television in a, in a contentious mood. And so that, you see that as the first mistake of Israel television. But up to that point, we had a bunch of volunteer, quotes, teachers from abroad and locally, including people like Morty Kirschenbaum um, and um, a guy named Louis Lenton from Ireland, who since died. He would have been very interesting for you. How many televisions would you estimate were in existence in, 19, in, the, um, in the Independence Day in 1968? Very few, a thousand, two thousand, I don't know. Very, uh, for the first broadcast, well, then people began to buy. Yes, once, once they knew there was something happening, yeah, yes. And, and so there was a big, and that was one of the reasons that Ben Gurion didn't want it because he thought there was tzena. And what would people need television for? They needed food. That was one of his reasons, another of it being against. For years, he blocked the introduction of television. He also stopped the Beatles from coming here in 1964. I mean, yeah. he had a different view of the world. Right. So he objected, or there was objection to the establishment of television, not just Ben Gurion, but because of economic cost, because this was Am HaSefer. That was a spe specific thing that was spoken and said? Or just a feeling? A feeling, I mm -hmm. would say. Mm -hmm. Because there would be problems with the objection to Pesel Vemasecha. For those reasons, Ben Gurion and others objected to television. Um, At that time, in your mind, did you have a sense of what? television could be, that it became, in fact, the, the common denominator for the entire world and, a, and as a social well, force. Well, it already was. In 1968? Yeah. They, it, was, everything, it was still black and white. It was still... Yeah, but it was worldwide by then. From about, from just after the war, Second World War, that is about... Um, 46, 7, 8, it began to take off yes. in the whole Western world. And I since wrote a book, co-wrote a book with a guy from England on broadcasting in the third world, how it migrated from the West to, the, from France, England, and the U.S. to the rest of the world including the uh, third world. So I was, let's say, pretty well aware of its potential, equally, almost equally afraid of its power. 
of its, yeah, and its populism, which is happening, but at, not necessarily because of television. And... You understood that I Love Lucy would be a formative Yeah, and I wrote a book on Dallas. I co-wrote a book on Dallas with the colleague, Professor Tamar Liebes. We, it's her dissertation. Um, so we, I was pretty aware of that, but I also was not a great believer in what was then the key focus of uh, research on the media, and that was changing opinions and attitudes overnight. I am a non-believer in quick effects of advertising. Over the long run, maybe, but not in the short run. But that's not the subject. It's all good conversation, though. My, my follow-up question would be, are you saying that political ads that we see on Israeli television during, during a campaign... Is exaggerated. The effect is much exaggerated. And it's believed in, however, by all of the leadership. All, what is the corruption? I mean, TK, Elif, not Elif, but Mata, uh, uh, Alpine Varbamio, uh, Moses, Noni yes. Moses and Walla are based on Bibi's belief that he had to be admired on television or he would lose. That's exaggerated, although that's closer to the possibility of effect, the sort of constant focus, than the short-run message that says X or Y or Z. Okay. So you're saying that all, all these campaigns are wasting their money yes. on putting out these... I'm saying that they, well, they might make... The problem of elections is if you change one vote, one mandate, the whole thing can swing. That's the problem. So there's some sense in that, but it's a big waste of money. Um, anyway, that's the end of my story, I think. Uh, um, there are so many other things to ask. Um, um, by the way, this is an Agav kind of question. Was Marshall McLuhan brilliant or an idiot? Brilliant, in my opinion. I mean, he said stupid, he said provocative things. Yes. But he had great ideas, especially his, the, the idea I like best is um, that the medium that's dominant at a given time era causes your brain to work differently so that in the era of print you began to think linearly so you went following a line based on the metaphor of a line of type you followed it blindfolded on either side so you trampled on rationally, so to speak. And this totally changed with television, he says. Now, it's probably wrong, but it's a great idea. Well, actually, in terms of radio and television, that was actually proven. In the, in the, in the, in the debates between Kennedy and Nixon, those who listened to it on radio thought Nixon won. Those who watched it on TV thought Kennedy won yeah, because okay. he was... Okay, so I also studied the Kennedy-Nixon debate. Yes, sir. And I agree, I know about those studies, that, and it was mostly it, people listened to the radio in their cars. Yes. And didn't see that Nixon was unshaven. Sweating, right, unshaven, right, right, right. Sweating right, right. after some antibiotic or something like that. So there's something to that. There's something to it that Kennedy came over as charm and intelligence. 
So there's something. But McLuhan is more important than that, I think. It's not really a good proof, but it's interesting. What was your thesis at the book you wrote on Dallas? What was the thesis? We try to find out whether American, the American culture, which is supposedly part of Dallas, um, was... Well, a small slice of it. It's the rich part of, of, of American, but yes. Yeah, right. Was understood in the same way in different cultures. So we took, well, actually we looked at several cultures. Japan was one in which Dallas failed. And the rest were cultures from here. We took kibbutzim, we took Russians, we took, uh, uh, so kibbutzim was anti capitalist, yes. so to speak. And they enjoyed it, but they didn't buy anything. Right, got it. Buy in both but, senses. Yes, right, right. And uh, we took um, Moroccans. Russians who had recently arrived. The Russians were interesting because if you ask them what they knew about, what they remembered, what impressed them was the credits. They were interested in the capitalist behind the film, not the, f I mean, they liked it, but uh, anyway, that's what it's about. Okay. Uh, can I ask you about um, before the Six Day War, this is this is this is not necessarily so much you specifically, although in the context of what Israel was like leading up to that war, your memories of what well, it was a huge anxiety, and uh, how did that express itself? You know, people were fearful. And nobody quite knew what to do. They, there was no real preparation, civilian preparation, uh, for a possible attack. Um, so, except, except for the except for the digging of huge mound, uh, yeah, uh, graves. graves of graves. Yeah. So everybody went to Bet Knesset on Yom Kippur and forgot about it for that, those hours until it happened. No, you're talking about the Yom Kippur War. Uh, sorry, yeah, right. Is so this the, um, no, for the Six Day War, I repeat, there was huge anxiety. For the Yom Kippur War, there wasn't, wasn't enough anxiety. In hindsight, that's certainly true. Of yeah. course, of course, of course. Uh, um, what did you remember feeling it before the '67 war in May? The, the closing off the Straits of Tehran. The whole the, the news is tightening on Israel. Yeah, right. And the, the surveys that we did showed that that people were anxious, and nobody knew what would happen. And then they were surprised pleasantly. What was it like to going from the fear to the euphoria? Ah, well, the beginning. First of all, during the six days, the news leaked, as is true of Israel generally, the news leaks. And so very quickly it was known that the Air Force had destroyed the Egyptian Air Force. And that was supposedly a big secret, but everybody knew it quickly. And uh, when the war was over, there was real jubilation. And what I remember distinctly is people from here going on walking tours of the old city. That was very, and it was reciprocal. Arabs came here, and Teddy Collick moved the bound the border wall 
those things, it was a jubilation. Did, um, uh, and what about the, the, the broadcast from the Arab countries, uh, I think specifically Egypt, saying that they were bombing Tel Aviv? I don't remember that. Uh, okay. That was, a, that was a, um, false reports coming out of um, yeah. Egypt and I, maybe Jordan too. Um, um, okay. Do you view television as the vast wasteland or as a... Well... Uh, was Minot who said that? Yeah, and I, I sort of met him. I was uh, really involved in uh, television industry in a way. Not, not involved, but a welcome member, as if Israel television was something. Um, I remember sort of uh, going to one of the festivals of television. And it was a big crisis just to show at that moment when there was about to be a strike of the ports and um, when I was away, tell, I think you, Yoram Perry? No. Yoram. Not Perry. Arben? Yoram Arben? No. Anyway, somebody was in charge. It was my deputy. And they invited to the weekly interview program the director of the ports, whatever. No, the workers, director, the head of the workers committee of the ports and the director of the ports, what's his, he was a general, Laskov, got in touch with Galili and say, how dare they produce or invite one side of a conflict to a television interview, again, thinking that television was the world's most frightening uh, uh, ammunition. And there, then the, the committee, the broadcast committee, decided that it would personally veto, uh, uh, what's it called, um, examine the potential interviewees from now on. And they said to me when I returned, who are they? And it is told as a legend, because I don't think it's true, that I delivered the telephone book to the board and said, these are the interviewees. But I don't think I was <laughs> courageous enough to do that. <laughs> when you look back now, uh, from when you started the television in 68, now 51 years later, <clears throat> how do you, uh, what's your assessment of how it developed? Well, it had many turns. My assessment. Yes. We were at now. The state of television in 2019. Well, remember it was a monopoly was the only channel. Oh, we should have should do it, yes. And... And then we had commercial television beginning in 92 or 93. Yeah, and, then and it was very public-oriented. I mean, it was really public broadcasting, not commercial broadcasting. Correct. And that I liked. And some people think it was good, and some people think it should... that that's terrible, that there should be multiple channels, and the more the better. So I don't think so, and the evidence is that the country can't tolerate 
so many channels, the evidence being that they're collapsing right this minute uh, from 10 to from channel 10 to channel 13 to and so on, to merging with uh, whatever it's called. Maybe that's just a bad business model. Maybe. But anyway, uh, I'm not thrilled by television now, although to my surprise that Ta'agid is doing much better than I thought it would. Okay, but I mean in the age now of the internet, where information is readily oh. available mm. everywhere, would there be a need for a public television? That's a big question to debate. I think it's totally different. I think the, the internet, well, I'm talking about, first of all, the, the network it's of interpersonal connections is a different thing. That's people talking to each other. Which they don't do anymore. Well, they do it on... On, on television. On, not on television, on the... On the web. On the social media. Yes, media, yes. But broadcasting is a totally different thing. It's, I don't see, even if Bibi says he has a Likud channel, he means that one of the social media, he has a site which uh, shows him nicely. Correct. But it's not public television. It's not any television. No, correct, correct. It's just, it's just a commercial. It's, it's propaganda, for, correct. Right. So I'm not thrilled with uh, what's the situation now because I like public television, which is diminished by the competition. Very few people in, watch public television, but in Israel, but in Britain, they still watch, and the, the commercial channels are very much like the BBC. They're trying to, to copy be them. Public. Yes, but okay. But the BBC is a is a beyond national institution. It's, it it has a koach unto itself. That's, that's I agree. So that's, that's my favorite. Yeah. I, I I then consulted for the BBC for some years on audience research. I used to commute for, I think, two years uh, to London, where I had a great office in what's now the Langham Hotel in opposite Broadcasting House in Upper Region Street. So I'm in love, or used to be anyway, with the uh, BBC. As a Klali, general question of looking at the state of Israel that you've been living in now since, uh, what did you say, 1963? Um, your feeling about the country in general? Well, first of all, it's a, just to look at it, it's a big achievement, the country. But politically, it's, it's a mess. It's uh, it's going in a wrong direction, democratically. It's becoming more populist, and Ayelet Shaked is a symbol of that, of trying to restore all power to the Knesset at the expense of the legal institutions so that it's just whether you vote. I mean, you can, if she wants to overturn rulings of the Supreme <laughs> Court and so on, and it's all in this direction of, uh, of uh, giving more power to the elected officials, elected people in the Knesset. And that's very much, that's scary because the real basis of democracy is this division 
among the judicial, the legal, uh, the executive, and the uh, uh, legislative. So America got that right, the checks and yeah. balance system. Right. Uh, how, how, um, her argument would be, it's tilted the other way. She's trying to balance out what she perceives as Yeah, but the, that's not balancing. That's slashing the power of the, the checks and balances. I mean, I don't, it's not that she's trying, okay, let's, that's a nice way of, a night editor of the Jerusalem <laughs> Post. <laughs> It's just, just, it's just, it's just for argument's sake. I'm just throwing it out there. Um, um, and Israel's Israel's place in the world. How do you view Israel's place in the world? It's amazing. I mean, it's not well liked but by it is, the but West, it is, but it is powerful. It's powerful. It's beyond any map that you can imagine. Israel is. If you look at a map, you can't find it. And you have to write Israel in the Mediterranean Sea to find it with an arrow or something. But it's viewed as a huge power. And, that, and who do you attribute that to? Partly to the noise it makes. But I mean, it's because there's so much to argue about it, and Israelis love to argue. So they go to the United Nations or UNESCO and, or any it's body of that kind, or the United States and in the old days, in the Obama days or the, the Clinton days and so on, not in the Trump day, and they argue. And they win much, some of the time, anyway. So it's in the headlines, the New York Times treats Israel as a power, not as uh, Sudan, sometimes Sudan is in the news, but rarely. You have to, it used to be, my rule is that you get into the media if you're in the elite, by saying something. And if you're in the non-elite, you get into the news by doing something, like turning garbage cans over or something like that. You have to do something revolutionary if you're a non-elite. But in Israel, the, the non-elites talk too. There's a, I mean, there are no people. So there, there are very few people that in Israel. Who? I mean, the population. Yes, yes. And so people talk. And they, but the, the, we thought that uh, the f conflict among the classical conflicts, the religious, non-religious, the Mizrahiim, Ashkenazim, that we thought those were over at a certain point, and now they seem to be regenerating. A reflection of the chaos in politics itself? Maybe. I don't know. A reflection of the feeling of power, too. Having it or not having it? Having it. And uh, uh, always seeing the Ashkenazi leadership as the holders of power, but they aren't. I mean, look at Miflegat Avulda, what happened to him. But those cycles come and go. Not really. For a long time, that was the case, until the Mahapach. Yes. Well, then, that, uh, and then it reversed. Yes. Yes. And that was to the credit of Begin, 
Begin emancipated all these mayors of the development yes, towns. Yes, yes, and yes. And that was the core of Oslo, even though it's not enjoyable, but it's... Uh, it, it also might be a function of Israelis who love what's ever new. So the new politician who forms a new party, how many have we had in the last 30 years? A party comes, it gets votes, it gets in... Uh, yeah, and uh, then it disappears. And then it disappears. Uh, Lapid's father, he had 18 seats, then did nothing. Yeah, I mean, well, it's not only, it also Tippi Livni. Tippi so Livni, et cetera, right. Yeah. Because Israelis like the newness. And uh, what's his name? Uh, or, yes. Yigal Yadin. Yigal Yadin, right. Party. Or, if, not saying the newness, maybe it's because Israelis are desperate for someone who has a solution. And if some new idea comes along, let's see if that works. Yeah, but the new ideas turn out to be the same ideas. Yes, yes. What are you proudest of having accomplished in your life? Nothing. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. Um, wait a second. We didn't ask a very important question. Israel Prize winner, 1989. What about it? That's a, that's a, that's a, that's a high-level achievement in life. Okay. Um, but it's for the things we talked about. Yes. But we haven't talked about my university career. At, at, at Pennsylvania? What? At Pennsylvania, U of P? No, that's the end. I started... At you, you mean? I started at Chicago. That was my first... Well, Columbia, I taught yes. as an adjunct right. for a while. Right. Then I went... My first row was at Chicago. I, this is relevant. So at Chicago, I was an assistant professor of sociology. Mm -hmm. Chicago was the great university of the time, but sociology had sunk, and it recruited from Columbia. There were five or six of us who were recruited by Chicago in about 1956, 55. Mm -hmm. And so while I was at Chicago, and you know about the, okay, while I was at Chicago, it was having a great time as a teacher because the students were great and so on. But the highlight of my career at Chicago was a series of five um, contributions to what was then the big event of the University of Chicago called the Latka Hamantash debate, and which Purim reminds me. So each year, six or seven faculty were recruited to give their disciplines view <laughs> of the lack of versus the Hamantash. So it was a big distinction. That's my main distinction at the University of Chicago was that I was on five times. Uh, and which side did you weigh in on? No, I was never on a side because sociologists don't uh, take sides. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And um, I can give you a copy if you want, but I don't know what you'll do. But you, you can have it. You can both have it. Okay. I have a supply, <laughs> thanks to uh, Graffos, which... Yes, yes, runs it off, yes. And um, so I was at Chicago, and while at Chicago, we had a visit from Don Patinkin. Don Patinkin was not yet, I think, president of the Hebrew University. Maybe he was. Also an American. He died. His wife is a neighbor. And Don Patinkin was looking for recruits for the Hebrew University. And he discovered me, not because I was a great sociologist, but because I knew Hebrew. And so he said, come to Israel. And I said, well, I have this job at Chicago. But we're, but we're planning, Ruth and I, to go to Israel when Ruth finishes her degree in musicology. 
So he was, he liked that. And he said, how about coming as a visitor for a while? So we began to arrange. So we did for two years. It was uh, 58 to 60. Whenever the Milchemet Sinai, whenever 56. that was. 56. Okay, so uh, uh, those years, mm -hmm. two years. And then later, as a result of that, we, I established a commute between Chicago and Jerusalem so that I could be two quarters, it's a quarter system, at Chicago, or three quarters, and get it, uh, whatever, a quarter off. And then I would be in Jerusalem, plus the, the fact that the two calendars aren't the same. So I could be at two places at one time. That's the name of one of my speeches, how to be in <laughs> two places at the same time. And so Patinkin recruited us. Ruth and established musicology, and I established communication at the Hebrew University. And, um, and then there was a tele uh, 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 taking leave to for television. Uh, and then I returned to the university until I retired in 63, or whatever that was. And in 63, I was invited to Pennsylvania. But I really never stopped commuting, first to Chicago, then to Los Angeles at the University of Southern California, which had another school named Annenberg. Yeah, the Annenberg School, right. Yeah, both USC and Pennsylvania. And and the BBC, so it was always uh, moving around, even now. Well, not now. <laughs> uh, you did you did a, a a study of the impact of twenty years of television. Yes. What was that about? The impact. The, the, of what way? In, in what in what sense? And wh who are you studying? We were studying. Well, there were some obvious things. I had predicted that with television, one of my small predictions, Israelis would know where the Gaza Strip is or Hebron on a map. After television, they should know that. They didn't know beforehand? They didn't know beforehand, they didn't know after. They still don't know. <laughs> okay. Okay. <clears throat> Where is Hebron? Or oh, uh, uh, Ramallah? You know where Ramallah yeah, is? Yeah, Ramallah is north of Jerusalem and Hebron is south of Jerusalem. Okay, you pass. Again. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, we did a lot of stuff. And it became clear uh, what's obvious that everybody had television. Everybody watched television for. Um, several hours a day that, uh, but this cha it was 20 years that's before there was a second channel, is that right? Yeah, so it was 20 years of one channel and it was established. I was no longer there. I mean, I was there to set up television, but, uh, and under other circumstances, I might have a story about how I stayed there. But I returned to the university. And uh, 20 years later, I don't think there's anything sensational, but I don't remember. So are you proud of having established television in Israel? Yeah, <laughs> but I'm not thrilled. It could it's have been, not it, original. It could have been more like the BBC. And it was at the beginning in an impoverished form. 
But then it gradually slipped into a commercial competition, having to deal with commercial competition and a decline, radical decline in popularity. And in quality. Yeah, and in quality. Although it tried after, it, it, it tried. And when you look at television in America, where that is the escape escape and the basis of everything it's it, television is everything in the united states okay H how do you how do you view that that it, it, well in two ways one it, it, in america in and of itself how how you see what it does to america what it is of america and what israel could learn from america well it's learned a lot from america let's face it it's uh but in some ways, it's also learned from England. I mean, the introduction of a com competing channel and then s two or three channels, but not, but it's a nationwide broadcasting rather than localized. localized. And uh, uh, the United States is sometimes seen as localized, but it's also nationwide with 500 channels on your television yeah. yeah and well television has changed television has changed altogether because yes. of that because of cable right so it's very hard to compare i mean you're right that big things happen on television like trump correct correct prime example you yes. Know. So it's very hard to compare. What was the thesis about where you were when you when something happened that you remember? What was your what was your Ah, well, when Kennedy is shot or when Sadat came to you don't know where I, I mean, you no, were. I was going to say I remember it like yesterday. I yep. was I was I was uh, I was 10 years old. I remember it like yesterday. Of course. Where were you? I was in I was uh, in 5th grade. And we had just come out of school on a Friday before Shabbat, and we're standing outside, and someone said, the, someone shot the president. I, I, Do you remember where you were when the Twin Towers um, were destroyed? Yes, I do. I was working at the Post. I do 100% remember the Twin Towers. Yes. Where were you? I was, I, was, I was at home, and I saw the second tower come down yeah. and then went to work and worked that night at the Post to put out that paper the next day. Yes. Mm. That's thrilling. Yeah, well, I was in a similar situation. I was at the anim in the garage of our apartment house in Philadelphia, and somebody said this. I went back upstairs and saw the second tower falling. So very often one remembers where one was. What was the thesis, though? What was the what was your... ah? The thesis was that there's a genre of television, which is the live broadcasting of history. We called it, which is a paradox: live and history. Yes. So. It's a genre of television which wants tel which allows television to be what it could have been or what it might be it still might be, namely uh, um, a get everybody to get everybody home, sit in front of the television set and watch history unfolding uh, before your eyes, and you're part of it. But it also has a, a unity, a unifying character about it, where everybody is there. Now it's harder uh, uh, to get everybody assembled, although in such events, like when Sadat came, everybody was there. Every, people dressed up to watch television. No way. In not Sadat, but the royal wedding. Yes, yes. 
Yes. So yes. There we have, I'll show you the book. Did you see it? No. No. Okay, so it's that kind of genre which television might have been, namely getting everybody together when it was, re when it's important for them to be together, not necessarily the rest of the time. So assemble, uh, st stay in touch with your loved ones, and watch history. And happen. be a part of history. Yeah. By watching it. Yeah. Yes. I, I, I remember two days after Kennedy, I was watching live when Ruby shot Oswald. I, I watched mm. it as a kid, and my first thought was conspiracy. Mm. Ten years old. I didn't know the word, but I understood he was yeah. bumping him off to shut him up. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Very good, very good. This was a wonderful, wonderful interview. I, yeah, I thank you. Wow. Thank you for this. Well, so I'd like to show you the pamphlet. Yes, I would love I to see wrote. that pamphlet on. This is the This is what? Source book on Zionist I in Israel. I Twenty five cents. <laughs> this is the Japanese edition of media events. Mm -hmm. If you know how to read this, can you see? Mm. No, but you'll never you see Charles and Diana? Oh, yes. Yeah. Now I do. But it's not important. That's not what you want to eat English. Here's the... Okay. Media events. Yes. Harvard University Press. Now that's not the original. It's this, but it's the same. Okay. And what else? Are the Latka Hamantas you want? May I ask you a question? Mm -hmm. You know, in the 1980s and the 1990s, I worked for Israeli television. Mm -hmm. And we were producing our own programs. If we speak about public television, do you think it's better if the broadcasting station is also producing? Yes. You think so? Why? You don't? Oh, no, I'm asking. Why? Because it's original. But you don't have the voice of uh, private companies. Why? You can do both. Oh, I see. You mean only pr local product? I wonder what is better. It's for you. <laughs> the voyage on bagel. <laughs> This is fantastic. This is fantastic. Okay. <laughs> this is this is a gift. Yes. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs> okay. Great. Okay. Good. Thanks very much. We'll pack up. <laughs>